you got a, a collection of ancient documents in your hand that we call the Bible, you got one of those there, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. <coughs> 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8. I was down at uh, in Ballina yesterday at the Touch Football Field, Saunders Oval there. I've got uh, some tournaments coming up that I'm playing in and, and, and also I'm coaching <laughs> some teams in. But um, yesterday it was, I don't know how hot it was. I think it was like 56 degrees. I'm sure it was. Or it felt like that to me anyway. Um, I'm, I'm playing in a team of guys and we're all over 40. And I know that some of you are gasping, oh my goodness, he doesn't look a day over 28. But um, I'm actually eligible to play in the over 40 team and you should have seen us out there running around in the heat yesterday and we were sweating and practicing our plays and so on at one point I, I was running and I swear I heard that chariots of fire music in the background you know dun, 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 dun. Do you know that one uh, but it wasn't obviously it wasn't but um, we went out there and we put in all this energy and all this effort because next weekend we've got a tournament that we're actually playing in the state championships um, down in Port Macquarie so we'll be going down there and playing but we've been training and getting together and uh, sweating and, and passing and running and doing all kinds of things for about probably three months now to get ourselves fit and get ourselves in the best possible position so that when we go down there we can go down there with an expectation expectation that something good might happen. We can go down there with an expectation that we might actually be able to compete with some of these Sydney teams. We might be able to, to get some victories on the board. We might be able to make some, some quarterfinals or semifinals or whatever. And I was just thinking about this the other day, that when we put in the, the effort, when we put in the effort and the energy, it's amazing how when we, when we put in effort and energy towards a goal or something, it raises the expectation level that we might actually achieve something uh, out of it. W when you go on a diet, for example, and you, you deprive yourself of Zinger Burgers and Big Macs and all those lovely, lovely things in life, when you deprive yourself of those, Daniel's sweating, and I, I don't mean Zingers, Daniel, I take that back, but when you deprive yourself and you work hard on your diet, then it, it's amazing in those moments you have a heightened expectation that you may actually lose weight. Why? Because you're putting in the effort required to do it. Well, if you want to get fit and you start jogging every day or going to the gym, um, like I obviously don't do, and um, you know, you're lifting weights and you want to buff yourself up and so on, you, you, you have at that moment a heightened expectation or a greater faith level that at the end of that, you're going to actually get fitter or build your body up. Why? Because you're putting in the effort. There's something, there's something about effort that attaches itself to expectation. And I want to just have a look at something that, 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 Peter wrote here, we've been talking about this area of discipleship for about three to four months now. And um, I want to continue down that theme again, because how many of you know, none of us in this room, nobody here was called to just be a convert. Jesus never said in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make converts. Go into all the world and tell someone about me, get them to put their hand up in a meeting so you can put a notch on the back of a door and say, well done, I got another one. None of this stuff is anywhere uh, in any of these accounts or anything that Jesus actually taught us. Jesus was very specific. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Now, now I put those two words together. The disciple is the end game. That's where we're heading. We want to become disciples of Jesus. We want to become uh, uh, the, probably the closest modern day thing to, to, to disciple would be like a, uh, an apprentice. So we want to be Jesus's apprentices and we want to consistently be learning from him and getting better at doing the things that he's showing us and teaching us and wanting us to do we want to become all that he wants us to become so we can do all the things that he wants us to do with this incredibly limited opportunity we have called life it's incredibly limited when I put it in the scope of eternity. Some days you wake up and you feel like, is this going to go on forever? You know, anyone have those days? It's just dragging on. But it's going to end. That's just a brutal reality. One day my life will end. But right now I woke up this morning and I checked the obituary sections of the newspaper and my name wasn't there. So I figured it's going to be a good day. So while I've got the breath in my lungs and the day that's been given to me, I might as well use it to get to know Jesus better, to become more the person He wants me to be and to do the things that I know He wants me to do with the time that I've got down here. But there's something about effort. When we put in a little bit of effort, there's something about that that heightens the expectation of an outcome and a result. You know, sometimes I wonder, whether as believers, many of us live with zero faith or expectation, either of seeing God do something through us, or many times of even seeing God do something in us, because we know when it comes to our growth in God, we put in zero effort. 
We put in zero effort. And because we put in zero effort, we have no expectation of any type of result, any type of change, any type of growth in our own world because we put in zero effort. Now, hear what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that we put in any effort to get saved. We are saved by grace through faith. There's nothing you can do to get yourself into those gates of heaven. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right in the sight of God. It is 100% grace and nothing else. If you think that if I just surrender my life to Jesus plus pray every day, that'll get me into heaven, you're wrong. Drop the plus. It's plus nothing. If you think that that surrendering your life to Jesus and then buying a Bible uh, and reading it every day is going to get you into heaven, you're missing the point. Drop the plus. It's simply surrendering to the fact that, you know what, I know this, I will never be good enough for God, no matter how much Bible I read, how many prayers I pray, how many times I come to church or how much money I give, I'll never be good enough. And when we come to that realisation, the beautiful thing about that is that's pretty much the end of the religious road. You get off that religious treadmill and you realise there's nothing you can do to gain salvation or favour with God. It's 100% grace. It's Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. It says in Romans, I think, that he became sin. He became sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. So when God looks at me now because of my surrender to Christ, he sees me as clean as he's going to see me. I don't go and do religious things so he sees me a, a, a whiter shade of white. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm clean in his eyes. Am I perfect down here? No, but he chooses to see me through the lens of Christ because I choose to surrender my life to him and to follow after him. So we're saved by grace. That's an undisputable fact. But the reality is this, even though we're saved by grace, growth takes effort. If you're going to grow in that relationship and grow as a disciple, then that takes effort. How many of you have seen people, I, mean, I, was, I was down in Ballina a couple of years ago and I ended up going to the Rouse Hotel to meet a mate to, for a, a lunch or something. Anyway, I walked in there and there's this guy in there and, and, and I, I've known this guy from high school. We used to play football together in high school when I was 18 years of age. And here I was at that stage about 40. And I walked in there and here's that guy. And, and this guy calls me over, oh, Alan, don't you remember me? And he's getting a bit narky at me and stuff. But anyway, I said, oh yeah, I do remember. Yeah, I went over, had a bit of a chat with him and, and he's, he's, what he's doing is he's reliving, remember when we were 18 and we played footy and we used to go and do this and we went out and did that and all this stuff. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at a guy that's 40 years old, same age as me, but he's really still 18. He hasn't grown at all. And I bumped into him a couple of times in, in the months after that. You know what he did? Every time I'd bump into him, he would talk about the exact same things. And he would want to go back and try to relive the glory days of when we were 18. Not that there was much glory in it. But he wanted, he, 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 it's almost like here's a man who's 40 years of age. He, he's been on planet Earth for 40 years, but you have not grown past 18. You have not grown past 18. And we all know people like that. And spiritually speaking, it's unfortunate, but many Christians can be like that too. I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. But, but you're still like a person that's just got to know him. Because time, time doesn't make you mature in God. Your Christian faith is not like a nice Shiraz. Just let it just sit there, do nothing with it, and it gets better as time goes on. It, it's not like that. And this is what, I love what Peter says here in Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. He says, For this very reason, make every effort. Everyone say the word effort. Make every effort. I don't want the word effort in Christianity. It's all about God. I mean, God does everything. Isn't that right? God does it all. It's all God. Well, yes. As far as salvation, yes. But as far as reaching the world, no. As far as your personal growth, no. As far as your maturity, no. As far as your issues being dealt with, no. And this is what... Peter's saying, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection, to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities, watch this, in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Who wants to be ineffective and unproductive in their faith? It, it literally means, uh, it means that you will be useless and unfruitful. And, and there are many people that could have been sitting in church for 50 years of their life and, and that's their description. They are still unfruitful and useless in terms of their faith. There's been no change in their own world because we come along, we take a note, we go, that's a good thought, that's a good idea, but we don't do anything with it except for walk out here, have lunch and get on with life. Or, or they, or, or, or they, so they don't change. 
Or they, they hear messages and read books on evangelism and that we need to reach the world and that God loves everybody. But we don't tell a single person that we follow Jesus, let alone tell them about Jesus because we're, we're, we're just not sure how they'll react. We, 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 don't, we don't pray for people. We don't offer to... to, 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 to we, we, we don't even, you know, here's a Bible. I'm not even going to make you read it, but here's the Word of God. It can, it can change your thinking, have a bit of a... We've got a faith, but our faith can end up being useless and unfruitful, but that's not the will of God. And discipleship is about developing a faith, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, working with God so that your faith is useful and fruitful. Useful for you in your everyday life and fruitful in the sense that it bears something good. We're being conformed into the image of God and God's also able to use us. If He wants something done, you're the kind of person He taps on the shoulder and goes, can you do this? Because I know that you're useful. You, you've developed your faith in such a way that it's useful. So we're saved by grace, but we grow through effort. And I want to just share with you this morning in the little bit of time we got left, just three thoughts about effort. In order for you to, to put in effort, here's the thing, you've got to be willing. If, if, if something's not that valuable to you, if I didn't care about going down next weekend and running against the best over 40-year-old touch footballers in the country and competing against them and, 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 and seeing if I can get a victory with a bunch of guys that we've been... If I didn't care about that, I wouldn't be willing to put in the effort to try to get the result. I just wouldn't be willing to do it. So there's got to be a willingness in the heart of a disciple. There's got to be willingness inside of us to want to move on and grow. Last week, we, or two weeks ago, we looked at Mark chapter 2. The, the paralysed man. And there's a small group of guys that get around this paralysed man. Everyone remember the story? And, and they, they take him, they carry him on a mat and they take him to the doors. But there's so many people there. So many people there that he can't, he can't get in. So this, this small group of people, they carry him up onto the roof and they dig a hole in the roof. And I don't know who paid to repair that because it doesn't tell us. So obviously that's irrelevant. But somebody would have had to repair it. They dig a hole and then they lower this guy down through the roof. And as a result of that, this uh, man, this gentleman, ends up walking out of there carrying the mat in his hand. Now, sometimes we're the guy being lowered down on the mat. And sometimes we're the person carrying somebody else. I want to just give you three characteristics, really quickly, three characteristics of people. How many of you, how many of you know there is no such thing as a super Christian, by the way? You can sit here and go, oh, Tony's testimony, though, it was such, so powerful because of his background or so powerful because of his this or he's gotten there because of... The no, no, let me tell you something. People get there because of the effort they're prepared to put in. People get there because of their ability to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and see what God wants to do come to pass in the world. There's no such thing as a super Christian. Somebody's not more anointed to grow than another person is anointed to grow. We're, we're all on a level peg here. The question is, how important is your discipleship process to you? How important is your growth to you? What are you willing to do in order to grow? Let me give you just three simple things that, that need to happen, three fundamental characteristics of disciples. Uh, without these, I guarantee you, you'll never become all you're meant to become and you'll never achieve all you're meant to achieve. Number one, there needs to be a willingness to be moved. Can you imagine if that gentleman, everybody rushed to that gentleman's aid and they walked into his room and his response was, no, I don't want to be carried anywhere. I don't want to be taken anywhere. Leave me alone. I'm happy just laying here in this mat. Uh, I, I don't want to be disturbed. And how many of you know there are many, many people that you and I know who are just like that in life? Just like that in life. People can almost get an identity in whatever the problem is. No, no, I'm a paralytic. That's what I am. Leave me alone. I, 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 I don't want to be moved. Have you ever seen those movies where somebody's got a broken leg? And like a war zone or something like that, or they've fallen out of a tree, but there's no medical attention available there, and they've got to take them somewhere. You ever seen those movies? And they pick them up and they go, Aah! and you see this, I'm in so much pain. I'm... And they're screaming and yelling and so on. But even in the midst of the pain, they know that they have to be moved from where they are in order to get healed. They know that in order to truly come to a place of wholeness, they can't stay at the bottom of the mountain with their leg wrapped around a tree. And as much as it's going to hurt to have somebody pick me up and carry me to an ambulance and take me away, I need to be moved from this place in order to be made whole. Every one of us know people that we know, 
that they need to make a shift in their life. They need to be moved in order to be made whole. But not everybody wants to be moved. If you want to grow in God, you've got to have a willingness to grow. You've got to have a willingness to be moved. Are you wanting to go from where you are now to becoming the person he wants you to become? Because here's the thing, you can say no. You, you, you can say no and stay exactly as you are. God will love you. You will make it into heaven. And, uh, you know, the angels will clap you on the way in, all that stuff. But perhaps, maybe, maybe you'll look back. Maybe, I don't know. I wonder if I had have allowed God to deal with this. I wonder if God, if I'd have allowed myself to go from being bitter and twisted and unforgiving. I wonder if I'd have allowed myself to be moved to a place of forgiveness. I wonder if I, 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 I could have allowed myself to be moved from a place where I was just full of hatred towards that person. I wonder what my life could have looked like if I was allowed myself, it would be painful and hard, but if I allowed myself to be moved to a place where I could get to that place of actually being able to love that person instead. There's got to be a willingness inside of us to be moved. And unfortunately, not everybody wants to be moved. In John chapter 5, Jesus asks this man a question. It's the pool of Bethesda story, and there's a pool there, and, and uh, you know, an angel would come down, they believe, stir the waters and so on. And Jesus walks up to a guy who for about 38 years has been sitting there unable to get healed. And Jesus asks him what appears to be one of the dumbest of dumb questions. He says, do you want to be made well? Here's a guy sitting there for 38 years of his life. And Jesus says to him, do you want to be made well? A, he's sitting right near a pool where his healing could take place. I mean, I'm, I'm going to make a dumb assumption that the reason he's there is because he knows if I can get in that pool quick enough, I'm going to be healed. So what do you mean do I want to be made well? For 38 years, I've sat on this stinking rock right here near the pool. Of course I want to be made well. But Jesus asks him the question, do you want to be made well? And it's not a dumb question, in fact. It's a good question. It's actually a great question. It's an honest question. Do you want to be made well? And I've got a question up there I want you to think about. Do you want to become the disciple that God wants you to become? Don't answer it. I want you to think about it. Do you actually want to become that person that he wants you to become so you can do that thing that he wants you to do, so you can reflect who he is more fully to a world around us that are getting further and further away from him? Do you want to grow into the disciple that God wants you to be? See, disciples know this, the pain of change will ultimately be less than the pain of staying the same. You can stay in a place of bitterness and hurt. You can stay in a place of brokenness. You can stay in a place where you never pick up these documents so you wouldn't have a clue what Jesus said. You can stay in that place, but the pain of staying there in the long run will be greater than the pain of actually changing. Which pain would we prefer to live with? The pain of staying the same or the pain of change? Both of them are going to bring pain at some point and in some way. Second thing, real quickly, there's got to be a willingness to be transparent. A willingness to be transparent. Yeah, I don't know if everybody in the city knew this, guy, uh, this guy's problem. We don't know if everybody knew that he was paralysed on a bed in his heart. We don't know. What we do know is this. What a beautiful story. There was a small group of people that did know. Amen. There was a small group of people that actually did know this guy's pain. So maybe if everybody didn't know it, somebody knew it. There was somebody in this man's world that knew about his pain. There was somebody in this man's world. Maybe he sent them an email or a text. He said, hey guys, I'm not doing well. I can't get up. I know Jesus is in town, but I can't find the ability to even get there to him. I, I love that thought that, 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 you know, sometimes we find ourselves like that man and, and, and when I'm not, I can't get myself to the place I need to be to see breakthrough and healing. I need someone to carry me. I'm struggling and I need someone to pray with me. I need someone to stand with me. I need someone to visit me. I need someone to help me because I can't do it on my own. I need somebody. But you know what? If you're not prepared to be vulnerable, how does anybody know? If we're not prepared to be transparent and go, you know what? Here's the reality. I'm actually not doing that well. I'm actually struggling. You, you, know, you know, in the eyes of God, you don't drop because all of a sudden you've exposed yourself of, as being not perfect. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he'll lift you up. Many of us live it the other way. I'm going to create an image where I stay lifted up. I'd rather have God lift me up than try to lift up myself. I'm, I'm not that strong. My arms aren't that big. J James chapter 5. James says an interesting statement. James chapter 5 verse 14. 
says this. He says, is anyone among you sick? Let him sit back and do nothing until the elders notice because they have nothing else to do but looking around for people who might potentially be struggling with life and its issues. Then let them try to chase you down and fit around your busy schedule in order to lock in a time that's most convenient for you so that they can pray for you. What are you chuckling at? Does your Bible say something different? Maybe, or what have we got? Have we got that? Huh? Well, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on. I've got a better translation. James 5.14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them. Everyone say, let them. Is anyone among you sick? Let them. Call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. That word sick means weak, feeble, powerless, without strength. It's not just talking about being physically sick. It's saying when you're feeling weak and feeble and struggling. What James is saying in the New Allen version, he's saying if you've got a problem, tell someone. If you've got an issue, tell somebody. Let them know. Life's not going that good for me at the moment. I'm having a struggle. Can you, can you talk to me? Can you pray with me? I want to let you know what's going on in my world. I'm going to take off the mask and I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be vulnerable. It's amazing how many people are angry at other Christians because they don't know this, the struggle they're going through. You've never told them. How are they supposed to know? How are we supposed to know? How am I supposed to know what's going on in your world if you don't tell me? Here's, here's the reality. You know, in Luke 12, I think it is, it says that, 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 that God knows the numbers of hairs on your head. You know that passage? Yep. Some of you he breezed over. Some of you he took a bit more time. But here's the thing. It says this. It says that God knows the numbers of hairs on your head. I don't. Which tells me something. God knows you intently. He stares at you lovingly. He ogles you. You're, he just thinks you're awesome. I don't. I'm sorry if that shocks you. Now here's the thing. I love you. I really do. But I don't love you like God does. Okay? I don't love you the same way God does. I love you the best I can with the gifts I've got and the capacity I've got, the knowledge I have, my personality, as well as knowing you and your needs and what's going on. You. I love you the best I can, but I'm not God. Don't expect me to love you like God. Don't expect the person sitting next to you to love you like God. Theo, don't expect Delma to love you like God does. She can't do it. She can't do it. I know you all say that. That's, you're learning from me. Say that. He said, no, she's close. <laughs> you're welcome, my young pad one. My young disciple. Disciples don't expect others to discern their weakness and pain because they take ownership of their own growth. The reality is this. You are not as important to others as you are to God, so don't live like you should be. Now, I'm not saying you're not important to others. I'm saying you're not as important to others as you are to God. So please don't expect them to treat you like God. Don't look to them to be all-knowing and all-powerful. It ruins relationships. It's an expectation that no man or woman can live up to. James says here, if you're sick, if you're struggling, if you've got an issue going on in your world, humble yourself. And would you let somebody know about it? so they can stand with you, so they can pray with you. This is a part of the process of your personal growth in God. Take ownership of it. Don't sit back and go, well, God, you, you tell them, God, because that's all they're doing. We're just sitting around all day praying for all of our friends all day, waiting on God for hours for words to drop from heaven so I know what's going on in your heart so you don't have to humble yourself. I can just tell you. There's something powerful about being transparent, especially when it comes to growing and so on. Your humility comes before your healing. Thirdly, I'll move along. Here's a question. I'll put a question up there. Who of you made aware of your current struggles and necessary areas of growth? Don't answer me. Think about it. Who right now knows what you're struggling with and who right now knows those areas of your world where you feel like you really do need to grow to become all God wants you to be and do all that God wants you to do? Third one, last one. There's got to be a willingness to be accountable. That's like, Dropping a bad word in church isn't accountability. There's got to be a willingness to be accountable. Hebrews 4.13 tells us this. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let me plant this thought with you. Accountability is unavoidable. It's going to happen one day. 
Why don't you practice it now? It's going to happen one day. One day, you are going to stand before God and, and, and according to the writer of Hebrews, there's an accountability that we're going to give. What a great opportunity for you right now to start practicing accountability to somebody else. To open up your world to somebody and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what needs to be done. This is where I'm heading. Can you, can you keep me accountable? Can you, can you, can you ask me how I'm travelling with that? Can you ask me how I'm going with that? You know, I, I'm one of these guys that uh, I like to be fit, as you can tell. <sighs> Can't wait till you're gone, Jenny. You're going to laugh at me like that every single time. It's just terrible. I'm going to miss you, actually. But you know what I can't do? I'm not the, I'm not the dude. Don't look out the window. I'm not going to be running around the block by myself. <laughs> you know those guys with their headphones on? <laughs> yeah. Can't do it. I tried it once. It was terrible. Terrible. I ran and then I'm, I'm like, I oh, probably only made about 100 metres. I'm thinking, this is stupid. Now I'm standing there watching other guys doing it, thinking, you guys need Jesus. There's nothing in it. It's ridiculous. I can't do it. But you, but you know what? Get me a bunch of guys and, and put me on a, on, a, on a paddock, bit of grass with a football, and I will literally run from sun up to sundown. There's something about the accountability of knowing that what I'm doing has an impact on other people and, and, and so on, that we kind of need each other and we're interwoven in a cause and interconnected in somewhere where we're heading. That sense of accountability and I can push myself and I can make the necessary adjustments and changes. I can hear truths because I know those truths are helping me get to... What are you chuckling at? Hey? I've been man-shaking it, so she's... <laughs> Here's a thought. James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Isn't that a frightening thought? Confess your sins to one another. Now, confessing my sins to God, that's one thing. I'm, in, I'm into that. I can do that. But James is saying confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Why do I got to confess my sins to you? Why do I have to come to you and humble myself before you? Why, why, why can't I just sit in my prayer closet and just talk to God about those things? Why, why does James say, no, do it to you? And why does he say it's so imperative that it's a part of the healing process? Let me give you a thought. Your future accountability to God is not as powerful a motivator as your current accountability to others. Think about it. You can do whatever you want. One day you're accountable to God. What sort of motivation for you to change is that? Be real. However, you can live however you want this week, but in seven days' time, someone's going to ask you how you're going and you have to tell the truth. Now what's your week look like? Looks a little bit different. Why does James say, confess your sins to one another so you may be healed? Because James knows this. If I'm walking through that journey with somebody else, I've got a much greater chance with that accountability of me making the necessary adjustments and changes, becoming who I'm meant to become, if I know that there's another person that's a part of that journey going to keep me accountable, then I ever will if I just keep going back. And how many of you know this because you do it right now? You've got that repetitive thing that you struggle with, that you keep failing in where you keep falling and you keep getting on your knees and you keep praying to God saying, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. You go and do it again. You fall short again. You fail again. Whatever it is, then you go back, you sit down. Not only now are you going back saying, God, forgive me, I won't do it again. You feel like, like a hypocrite. The devil's on your case. You, 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 you get to a point where then you start condemning yourself because I know I'm gonna, it's going to be a vicious cycle. I'm going to fail again in a week. I'll go back, apologise. You can break that cycle by bringing another human being into that process. That's what James is saying. Confess your sins, your weaknesses. Confess those things to one another and walk the journey together. The first time God ever said something wasn't good was when it was just him and Adam. He said, it's not good. You need other people in your world. So three very simple things. A willingness to be accountable. A willingness to be vulnerable or transparent and a willingness to want to move. And I reckon as disciples, if you've got those three things in your world, then you're on the beginning of an upward spiral, an upward journey when it comes to your growth in God. If you, if you say no to a willingness to move, if you say, no, I don't have a willingness to be transparent and no, I don't have a willingness for accountability, then let me just say this to you. Have a good look at yourself today and get used to what you see because you probably won't change. Amen? Yep. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. 
God, thank you. I'll just get, Dan, you want to come up? Just thank you for uh, this time that we've had here this morning, Lord. And uh, Father, we, we, we don't just gather here, God, just to hear uh, words. Father, we're not gathering here just to sing songs. But uh, Lord, we want to, uh, Father, be transformed. We want to be changed by you, God. And Father, I want to pray right now, Lord, just for each person that's listening. Holy Spirit, whatever you've spoken into their hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you would water that seed. I pray that as we get up and leave this place, that we wouldn't just move on to the next thing. But that, Father, we would wrestle with and we would look at our lives. God, are we, are we serious about this discipleship journey? God, are we happy just to be going to heaven? Is that enough? Well, Father, do we really want to make a difference down here for you? Do we really want everything that you have to give us? Do we really want to be everything you want us to be? Or is it just about fire insurance? Lord, hard questions, but I pray for each person in this room that we would ask those questions, Father. We would wrestle with those questions. And we come to a solution. God, and I pray for each person here that the solution would be, yes, I, I, I take this journey with Jesus serious. I don't want to waste my life down here chasing things when you've got so much more for me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen.